Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to our recording for the Compliance Crossword Podcast today. My name is Blaise Wabo, your host, and uh, joining me today is our co-host, Ardi Lawani, and our special guest, Leila Ramnath, as well. Um, on the Compliance Crossword Podcast, we discuss the intersection between security, privacy, compliance, and risk management. Um, I'm really excited about today. Ardi, how are you doing? I'm great, Blaze. Uh, not so sunny in Florida today, but we're weathering through. How are you doing? I am doing really well, thank you. It's uh, 76 degree here in beautiful Denver, Colorado. I hope you and your family are safe preparing for potentially some storms or hurricane there. Yes, uh, we're all safe here. Um, it's just the the way of living in South Florida. <laughs> We're in the risk management business, so I, I guess you calculate the risk before you live there and you put some controls to uh, to make sure you're safe. So oh, It's all in my BCP. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's taken care of. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Leila, thank you for joining us today on our conversation on what is ESG and why do we care? How are you? I'm good. Really great to be here. I'm in New York and so far so good. Sunny, Sunny and clear. Very good. Hopefully, you guys don't get any uh, any leftover rains from uh, from what's swooping through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Well, I know you were traveling um, a little bit recently, so thank you again for joining us, um, um, Leela. Why don't you tell the audience about kind of what you do? And I was just so impressed when we met. Right, um, um, you are the head of ESG at Robert Pincus. You went to uh, MIT and uh, and John Hopkins. Like, I'm I'm amazed by your resume. Why don't you tell the audience <laughs> more? <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're too kind, please. Um, so, so yeah, I, I lead uh, ESG at Warburg Pincus. Um, I've been so by by way of background, Warburg Pincus is a global private equity firm. Um, we invest um, across the globe. Um, a lot of investments in the U.S., um, but also Europe, China, um, Southeast Asia. I was just out in Singapore at our annual meeting out there. So. Um, we have a broad breadth, but also we invest across a number of sectors, um, including technology through industrials, um, through energy transition investments, cybersecurity, of course. Um, so we, we have a big breadth of um, range of investments. And my, my role is really to work with our, um, at, well, I wear many hats as, as head of ESG. First, I I support and, and, and create our policies and programs as a firm. Um, so we are we have a various number of commitments to be responsible investors. We've signed on to a lot of protocols. So it's it's a it's a topic that's very important to us. Um, we as we invest, we have due diligence processes that um, we adhere to um, as they relate to ESG. Um, and this is pretty mainstream across the private equity industry now to incorporate ESG into the investing process. And we can talk about that a little bit. Um, I work with our investors to help them understand our programs. Um, and finally, but really exciting part of my role is to work with portfolio companies to help them manage their programs um, as private in, in private markets. ESG is becoming more and more prevalent and important. So um, so that's been a great um a great opportunity to help companies do that. Um, prior, prior to Warburg, I spent about half my career in more traditional finance um, and then shifted gears, um, did a little stint in East Africa, uh, working on an impact projects and supply chains, um, worked at a fashion focused supply chain oriented um, investment firm. And, um, and here I am. So happy to be with you, you both today. Wow, that is impressive, Lena. I have to say, you have one of the coolest experiences that uh, I've heard in a while. So, <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you again for joining us today. Um, plus, uh, Singapore. My my older son is in middle school. He wants to. He loves. He want to go to Singapore sometime. So, um, um, we'll, we'll talk offline about some uh, some stories with Singapore there. <laughs> but uh, thanks again for joining us today. Again, we'll be talking about what is ESG and why do we care. Um, and as we kick off this conversation later, I don't think there's anybody better that we can have this conversation with. Uh, just so to educate our, our audience here, um, let's 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 uh, use a crawl walk type mentality. Um, um, so as we crawl, what is what is ESG? Let's start with the basic. What what is ESG? Sure. So ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. 
And this term has basically original originated in the in the capital markets. So it's basically a capital markets or investor framing of a range of topics um, that are non financial factors that can influence a company. Um, and and so um, it's it's been a a lens for which investors can use to look at a broader range of risks and opportunities when we look at an investment. So. Um, so it, it really expands. I mean, there are a lot of definitions around what ESG means today, and some people use it as a kind of an asset class. Some people use it um, more broadly. Some people are really, when they say ESG, they focus on really one pillar of it. But the, for purposes of this conversation, the way that we think about it is it's, it's a way, it's a lens through looking at investing. So you can look at a broader range of risks and opportunities that relate to both ES and ES and G factors. Um, and, and I just want to say it's not not just about looking at what a company does directly, but it's about not only their direct operations, but their what their products impacts are, are on the world and also the supply chain um, and where the company is being sourcing products as well. So um ESG kind of has a broad range of so just top t- categories under each pillar. Under the E, it can be a number of things like around climate, um, climate risks, use of natural resources like water, ecological impacts, biodiversity, um, pollution and waste, um, ha- you know, use of chemicals, things like that. But then also on the positive, and that doesn't only have to be a risk orientation, but also an opportunity set. So a lot of opportunities around decarbonization, renewable energy, you know, green buildings, things like that. So that's kind of the arching uh, aspects of E. On the S, we have a broad range of aspects as well. Human capital issues, um, product safety, um, stakeholder engagement, and, you know, having a social license operate um, and expanding access to, you know, things like financial inclusion, digital access at categories like that. On the governance side, the G um, is really focused on things ranging from kind of executive conduct, code, code of ethics, corporate behavior, um, and, and you know, cyber cybersecurity being an important part of that. Corporate governance issues as well, board diversity, executive pay, um, tax transparency, um, board structure, things like that. So it's a, it's a big catch-all for a lot of categories, but um, it's a lens that's becoming a lot more important to investors, especially as of late. Leila, thank you for that that introduction. It's um, amazing to see your knowledge in ESG and then letting us know the basics of what the three pillars are of ESG and, and even in a broader sense that we hadn't known before. So why is ESG becoming a huge trend and, and why should we care? Uh, it's a great question. Um, certainly has become a big topic of conversation as of late in, in a lot of uh, forums and actually globally. Um, I'd say, you know, it's become a huge focus for a variety of reasons. One is, you know, investors, like I said, investors are really focused on this. Um, it's It's been another lens for companies to really be evaluated on when, when companies, when investors are evaluating um, a certain specific company. And the reason is that, you know, there are a few, few factors at hand. One is um, there are a lot of investors that have signed on over the years to voluntary commitments for responsible investment. So, there's an organization called the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. Now, this is a um, an organization that's been around for some time, but there's been an uptick on the number of um, investors that have signed on to this. Um, a couple of years ago, I remember in 2020, the stat was one out of every three dollars invested in the U.S. incorporates ESG um, factors. Um, now that com- that that amount has grown um, significantly, um, and you know there are estimates of around 100 trillion dollars in assets under management that have voluntary signed on to that you know those principles for responsible investment. So that's that's one thing is you know voluntary commitments by pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, um, any type of asset owners are really are committing to these principles because of a lot of focus from their stakeholders or just their own under understanding and, and commitment to these issues. Another another reason why it's very much in focus today is that there are a lot of regulators that have taken on ESG. Um, and so it's manifesting in different ways across the globe. But just a few examples are in the EU um, right now, there's a sustainable finance disclosure regulation that mandates that any financial market participants should 
um, uh, should disclose certain regulate regulatory um, aspects of their ESG profile of their investments. So this has come into play in the UK. There's an economy wide focus on climate disclosures. Uh, in the U.S., um, you know, there's there are a number of um, initiatives focused on climate. Um, so the SEC right now is looking at mandatory disclosures for climate reporting. Um, there's some uh, certain legislation around supply chains that are happening globally, like in in the U.K. and Australia. So um, and 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 there are certain listing requirements for public companies in, in places like in Hong Kong, for example. So. Um, it's been it's been a huge focus on from the regulatory focus as well. I'd say the third driver, um, but really most exciting and important driver, is that companies are finding that ESG can really leaning into that and defining it for their com- for their respective companies can really help on a value value creation side. So a lot of companies are finding that if you have a strong kind of ESG profile, it can help attract more customers um, with with your positive reputation, more sustainable products. Um, it can maybe lead to cost reductions, maybe lower consumption on energy, raw materials, things like that. We're finding that, you know, a lot of imp- companies use it to attract talent, um, especially younger generations of talent, really motivating in- employees to really want to work for firms that are, are um, values aligned. Um, and, and, you know, because of the focus on investors, it's really become an area for to get access to capital. A lot of, um, companies are really wanting to lean in on ESG because it's helping, you know, get access to, to financing or um, other capital. On the flip side, companies that have a weak profile on these issues um, are having trouble reputationally. Um, there, there are risks around, um, you know, especially, you know, the supply chain issues that we've been seeing in the last couple of years. Um, a lot of that, um, you know, the companies have had more visibility into their supply chains, which has been a really focus from on the ESG world, um, have, have found that they've actually been able to be more a bit more resilient to some of those issues. So um, there's a broad, you know, but because of, you know, the investor class, because of regulation and because of value creation, really tangible things that companies can benefit from ESG has caused um, a lot of corporates to lean in on this. Awesome. <clears throat> Leela, thank you so much for, for the uh, four pillars that you let us know about why ESG has become such a huge trend and, and really why all organizations should care for it. And I think you kind of hit it in your last pillar um, when you talked about the value add of ESG. Um, but where do you see, uh, the, in your opinion, what is the future of ESG in the next decade and, and how does that, that translate back to us? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a great question. Right now, the term ESG, there, there's been a lot of um, nuance around the term ESG, what that means. Um, there are a lot of different flavors of it, depending on the type of investor um, that, that are out there, the different corporates. But I think the bottom line here is that ESG, um, the, a form of ESG is here to stay. It's, it's, it's basically this understanding in the market that, um, you know, at its core, ESG is really helping companies, investors understand how um, non-financial or ESG factors impact a company and how a company impacts those factors. And and so um, I think what we're going to see, you know, we're already seeing the regulation kind of play out in different areas um, and different flavors, as I mentioned earlier. But I think in the next 10 years, you're going to see this is mainstream. This is not a separate, this is going to be core to business. Um, it's, it shouldn't be a silo in one part of the business. Um, you know, someone's putting out a report um, on one side and then the, the, it's business as usual and the, the rest of the business. It's a really strategic um, part of the co- company to understand, you know, what are the categories of um, what sectors do, does an invest, do, does a particular company want to participate in? Um, how does it want to em- engage its employees? Um, what kind of products is it? Um, you know, putting into the world and what are the impacts of those products? These are the holistic kind of strategic decision making that um, companies need, will need to be making um, and, and are making today. And I think when you think about ESG, that's just that's just the core kind of tenets of, of, of that is really understanding um, these issues. I think another big piece that is a huge topic right now and it will continue to emerge is around measurement and really understanding what a company, what your company is doing, how you're measuring it, um, and right now a lot of the measurement is self-reported. So you know a lot of like, 
you know, carbon emissions calculations or their calculations or um, they're, they're done by the company, they're self-reported or kind of um, if you're talking about, you know, the, what your product is putting out into the world, your supply chain, the cybersecurity profile posture of your company. Um, these are all self-reported things. I think now, you know, in the next 10 years, you're going to see more um, rather than kind of trust in self-reported data, more evident need for more evidence um, based kind of reporting and in real time, you know, when we have internet of things and, you know, all the uh, new technology where you can actually get primary source data. I think we're going to see a lot more of that um, in the next decade around um better report, not only reporting, but also better data, better quality of data and more primary source data. Lilo, this is incredible. Uh, great information here. Uh, I'm a simple guy, right? And uh, for me, the biggest takeaway so far, uh, Lilo has been corporate responsibility and accountability for investors and the public, essentially, right? And I think back in uh, 2017, when I started in my own personal investment, um, I, I had a mentor um, challenge me and say, Blaze, take a look at where your, your, your investments are going. Like, what companies are they supporting? So mm-hmm. I reached out to my financial um, um, uh, broker or whatnot, and uh, I said, for my 401k, what companies am I invested in? He gave me a very vague answer. I'm like, look, I actually want to see the company names and what they do. So he sent me a list of company names and I researched them. I was shocked by some of the activities that they that they support um, by just Google searches. And I was like, it's time for me to make some changes. So I, I, I since then, I've been investing mostly in the self-directed uh, IRA. But uh, again, that's how that ties to a simple guy like me, right? And why it's important. <laughs> And uh, I have kids as well, and I think about a uh, a future for the world I want my kids to live in. It it, it makes sense, right? Um, however, um, as you mentioned, there are a lot of uh, different standards there, and companies are self-reporting. A lot of confusion right now in the industry, uh, and for capital markets as well on what they need to do. Uh, so my question here, Layla, is: There are many ESG reporting standards and framework, right? Uh, do you have any, do you have some tips uh, on how to select one standard and uh, what relevant topics to report on? Yeah, you know it's a great question and a hot hot topic these days um, around reporting and what are the right me- metrics. And I get that question a lot. Um, I think the answer is there is no one definitive kind of list of things. There there are different lists that are very um, or frameworks that are very very useful. I would say from from where, where I sit as an investor, um, when I look through the lens that what what is very um, was a framework that's been very helpful for a lot of companies has been um, what was you used to be called the SASB or continues to be called the SASB standards, but now it's rolled up into what's called the ISSB. So that's the International Sustainable Sustainability Standards Board, which was newly created and it was a con- kind of a um, convergence of a number of uh, different frameworks that have come together and which has been honestly really great. It's been great to see the convergence of a number of frameworks just to just put a little bit more clarity around the issue. I think what's also great about the set of standards or, or what, you know, the foundation being um, originally from SASB, the sustainability accounting standards board is that, you know, what, what the way that this organization approaches it is that they take, you know, a, a materiality approach to ESG. So what that means is to say is that, you know, all the categories I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of categories that a company can focus on, um, but some are more relevant to certain sectors than others. So if you're, um, you know, an industrials company that has a lot of a large supply chain and and, and, you know, producing a product and use a lot of chemicals in your process, you know, there are certain material factors that you should be focused on, um, you know, very, a lot of climate related issues, a lot of, um, you know, workforce issues, a lot of chemical management, waste, um, water, those type of issues. On the flip side, if you're a tech company and you're a software business, um, you know, there are, you know, a lot of those issues may not be as relevant to your business. Um, and, and so, what SASB does is say, what are the what are the ESG factors that are most material for your business, and what are the most um, that you can align with financial the financials of your company. So, for example, for a software company, you know things like um, 
you know, focusing on the E, that the, the environmental focus, the climate um, is, you know, is, is a cross cutting issue, honestly, that every company should be looking at now because of a lot of the regulatory focus, a lot of the reporting requirements. But, um, you know, if you have data centers, you know, that that's quite a big um, energy um, kind of use area. Um, so, so it's something that, you know, software companies can think about. Um, or, but if you're on the cloud, you can kind of think about which cloud provider you're using and what what's the efficiency or energy use of that that um, that cloud provider. Um, you can also think about e-waste, and so that that's something that comes up a lot with you know tech companies. But on on the social side, there are a lot more kind of areas that have focus. Um, you know, of course, workforce well-being, typical human capital type issues. Um, Diversity and inclusion is a huge topic in tech in tech companies today. Thinking about what is your strategy, initiative, metrics, um, community engagement. You know, how are you engaging with, with the local community around digital well being and, and CSR issues? Um, selling practices, like how are you selling your your company's um, uh, product into the market? How are you using data? Customer, are you collecting customer data? If so, are you protecting it appropriately? Are you, how are you using it? Are, are you, use, you know, using AI and are you doing that in a responsible way? Um, and then, you know, things like in the governance side, of course, there's regulatory and, and, and legal compliance. Um, cybersecurity, it, it also kind of fits under the, the G um, and making sure that you have someone in charge of that. And how are you approaching it? And what are, what, what are you using to manage that? So these are this is just some some examples from that framework, that SASB um, framework that they would highlight for a software company. What are the issues? And you know, I think um, what what I always advise companies is start with you know the most material issues for your industry. Don't try to boil the ocean around the many many factors of ESG. Start with these type of um, you know most material factors for your industry, and you can look online and look up the SASB standards, and you can look up your sub, sub industry and. And it'll outline what those things are, what are the metrics that you can do to measure all the things that I just mentioned, and and take a look and see what your organization does um, and measures today. You know, I, I find a lot of companies are already measuring a lot of these things. They may not think of it as ESG, but it's um, it's always good to take an inventory to see what you're measuring today. And then beyond that, look at what are the gaps, what are the areas that you're not measuring today, and areas that you want to improve on. And so. Starting with SASB, and then you can then you can kind of look a little bit more broadly at different frameworks. Um, the GRI is another framework that a lot of corporates use and help that they think help them tell their story. Often, it's helpful to look at peers and to see what they're you know what they're re- reporting in their sustainability reports, which are all um, if they're public companies or many companies will publicly share their ESG reports. So you can kind of see. You know, from a benchmarking perspective, what is what are others sharing um, externally? What are they reporting on? And that can kind of help guide you as well. So, um, but but I would say to answer your question, ISSB or the SASB standards are a great place to start. But there are so many other frameworks out there. Um, uh, I just finally add that you know, on the climate side, there is the TCFD or the task on climate related financial disclosures it's a mouthful but basically it's a it's a um, it's a protocol that or a framework that a lot of governments have have um, committed to uh, so that's another thing that a lot of companies are starting to adopt as well so um, there are a lot of frameworks but I think starting with SASB and kind of mo- moving your way out if you're just getting started is is a, a prudent approach and can help um, because it actually, what's good about SASB, it, 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 like I said before, it aligns with financial drivers of your company. So it can help you really engage with your internal stakeholders to understand what is the most material from an ESG perspective, but then also what can help move the meat needle for your business as well. That makes total sense, Leda. Thank you for the incredible tips. Um, and, and I think, you know, following the ISSB or the SASB um, standards, it's a good place to start. And uh, I think the, your point you made on materiality uh, is very, very important as well, uh, because, you know, if you're starting to report on ESG, you can't just report on everything, right? So um, starting on the, on the issues that are material um, as it relates to your organization. And you also mentioned be- benchmarking um, other companies in your industry that have published 
maybe the ESG reports, you can use it as a benchmark on uh, kind of guide you on where to start. So great tips there. Um, you mentioned different order standards as well, depending on where the focus is. But I also know that recently um, the SEC had a uh, an ESG proposed new rule for most public companies to disclose their their greenhouse gas emission and to report on how their their business is affected by climate change. Um, in your opinion, how are most companies, uh, most public companies, reacting to this uh, SEC proposal? And do you think it's going to go into effect? And if yes, when? You know, that, that's a great question. I know under it's under comment right now. So um, I guess it remains to be seen what in what form it'll um, manifest in. But um, but one thing I'd like to say is beyond, you know, th- this rule, if it were to be impact implemented, uh, it'll impact companies, whether you're private or public. Um, and that's what's interesting about it is that in the current iteration of it, it includes a um, a a part of the rule that's focused on scope three emissions. So that's value chain, um, supply chain emissions. And so, um, you know, regardless if a company is private or public, if they're in the supply chain of a public company, if, if they are end up break, being regulated under this rule, then, um, then anyone, any company in the supply chain of a public company will have to, um, well, well, it, depending on the wording of the, the scope three rule, because it, it there's a certain nuance to it. Um, they might, they, they will likely have to be um, reporting on scope on their emissions as well, because a lot of companies scope one and two, which is their direct emissions or indirect through purchase electricity. Those emissions are the scope three or supply chain emissions of another company. So uh, I'll just say that the SEC pr- proposed rule would have far reaching implications across companies inside and outside the U.S., even if companies are not listed in the U.S., if they may not be regulated under that, specifically if they're in the supply chain anywhere around the world, but may have to do that just de facto through, through, their, uh, through their customers. So, Leela, thank you for um, giving us a great explanation of ESG, how it relates to everyone, going through some of the new uh, SEC proposed rules that are coming up. Um, And and I know you kind of hit on this earlier, but I wanted to to deep dive into it. What are some exposure risks or consequences for organizations that do not implement and report on ESG? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I would say, like, like I said earlier, right now it's it's basically a table stakes to have some sort of ESG orientation around your company. I find that a lot of companies have a lot of components of ESG, but may not have put it into a strategic framework. But there's there are a lot of benefits to doing so. Um, I think one being the major being is is access to capital. Right now, you know. Any in any capital markets participant pretty much is starting to ask if they haven't already questions around an ESG strategy, um, any policies, any processes that are in place, um, any governance around these issues um, at the board level or um, you know internally a point person who's focused on these issues. So that's one thing I think access to capital and just being on the front foot. You know you never want to be more reactive to issues. You want to be proactive on these things. So that that can be really helpful. Um, I think another thing is because of all the regulations that I mentioned earlier, there, you know, I just mentioned a few, but there's so many regulations related to ESG now uh, that are, you know, whether it's about workforce issues or supply chain issues from a labor perspective, um, or, you know, the, some of the scope three kind of the, the, the climate carbon related um, rules that we mentioned earlier, um, there, there are a lot of regulations that are focused on this and a lot of emerging regulations. So the more a company can be prepared for these, it, the more um, resilient a company can be and, and, and you know, be able to be prepared for anything that might come through on the, on the regulation front. Um, I'd say also, you know, they're just really um, operational things that are related to this. So, you know, a company that has good health and safety acumen and, and a good, dis, you know, um, process and governance and frameworks around that will most likely have um, low safety issues, um, low incidents around 
um, you know, health and safety or, or injuries or whatnot. And usually, you know, of course, nobody wants to be hurt on the job and there should, shouldn't, you know, I, the, the best safety number is zero injuries. Um, but, you know, it, beyond the human aspect of it from a business perspective, actually it disrupts operations when there is an incident, um, however minor it may be. So um, that, you know, there are clear business reasons um, beyond um, the, you know, it being the right thing to do and wanting to be do well by your employees. You also have potential impacts to business operations. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, reputation is so important. As when you're a company and you have a brand to support and a brand image, um, this is an incredibly important topic for accessing customers or retaining customers. Um, same thing with employees. A lot of employees are really focused on understanding what the company's purpose is, what are they doing in their communities. Um, a lot of younger workers really want to, you know, work with companies that are. Um, you know, align with the values that they have. And so that's another, you know, area where, where we're seeing, you know, reta retaining employees and being able to, be, being able to attract employees are, is really important. So having an ESG strategy is really um, about having a consistent perspective and, you know, uh, com communication on the very various things a company is doing and, being able to use that in ways to engage people, but also kind of um, address any, you know, any kind of crisis issues that may come up or um, mitigate against any risks. Um, and so companies that don't do that uh, might be more exposed potentially to more risks. That's great. And it's good to hear that the ESG kind of goes uh hand in hand with whatever compliance that you're working on anyways. It's always good to be proactive rather than reactive. It's always good to be risk-based uh, for your organization and your needs. And it seems like, as you said, ESG is here to stay in whatever capacity that means in the next you know, few years or even longer. Um, and so to incorporate that back into your compliance, um, into whatever your, your procedures are, whatever your management systems set to be, uh, would be the best, best route is kind of what it seems. Did I, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's interesting because ESG is becoming more into the compliance realm because of a lot of the things that you said, you know, it is a risk management, important risk management. Um, exercise is in the realm of regulatory now. And you want to make sure that you have the right processes in place, the right governance around these issues, and really be proactive around um, these topics so that um, you know, a company is resilient to anything that may come its way. Lila, thank you. I think the pandemic has proven that uh you know, the way we would do business and the way we work has changed forever. And I think ESG is going to do the same thing as well. I think uh, businesses would have to incorporate uh, ESG in order to stay relevant in our in the world we're going to start living in. Uh, so Lila, Artie, thank you for your time today. For our audience, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we discussed um, what is ESG and why do we care? Uh, Lila did a great job describing uh, the different three pillars of ESG. Uh, we talked about the different uh, standards and framework on how to report ESG and later uh, get, uh, gave some great tips on uh, what standards to focus on and uh, from a materiality standpoint as well, uh, how to narrow down uh, how your company should approach this. We talked about a new SEC uh, proposed uh, guidance rule. Uh, and uh, finally, we concluded by uh, describing some of the exposure risk of not implementing ESG. And finally, ESG is here to stay. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you on our next episode next month. Thank you. Thank you.